Hey, Tommy, it's the dynamic duo, father and son. We're back together again. Well, I don't know about dynamic, but it certainly is a duo. And in this podcast, we are talking about a little bit of everything. Yeah, th- some of the best cars that we've recently driven. It's been a good couple weeks for cars. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you what they are. You're going to have to listen to the podcast, but you can already see one of them. I just came back from the uh, new Range Rover drive. Absolutely. We're going to talk about the Range Rover, and I am even going to tell you one of the best cars I have ever driven, period. And I have driven a Reliant Robin, so that is saying something major. You you almost rolled a Reliant Robin. Well, you almost rolled a Reliant Robin. I was filming. (laughs) (laughs) That's for all of you fans that go way back to the early days of TFL. Uh, And then, of course, I'm going to get to do a rant. Can I do a rant right away? Yeah, what is your rant about today? So uh, I got to drive this uh, $218,000 Range Rover. Okay, yeah, that is a rant about why it's so expensive. No, it's not. It's a rant about never put white carpets in a Range Rover when you park (laughs) it on black dirt. (laughs) If you're not watching the podcast, the picture is me standing in front of the new Range Rover SV. Uh, with uh, the dirt being black and my shoes being very black and the carpet being very white. Uh, I, I was reading the comments in the video that we put out and everybody agreed that uh, white carpet is a really bad idea. Now, it looks cool. Is this the autobiography? This is not the autobiography. It is not. I think it's called the Signature. It's the one that uh, has the four-seater uh, that has the exclusive uh, seats in the back. And I can get I'm, that. I'm thinking that's the autobiography, it's Dad. Not, I think not. it's SV because SV stands it's for special, special Vehicle, doesn't it? It does stand for Special Vehicle. I will tell you because I've got the pricing right here. I brought it with me. I was not. Wow. I was prepared for this, believe it or not. All right. So uh, just, just so you're curious, uh, the uh, – the, um, SE, the, the twin turbo V6 with 395 horsepower uh, and a mild hybrid starts at 104,000. Okay. You'll never see that one. What a bargain. This one uh, is the SV. Um, do you have the lineup in the. Oh, I do. It's above the autobiography. It is above the autobiography. So the autobiography is 160. The SV is 218. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the autobiography is 160. I thought the autobiography was the top. This First is- of all, why? We, can you explain that name? I never understood no, why you would name ask. a vehicle I, the autobiography. I asked I ask what the SV was. It's a special vehicle, uh, but they didn't tell me what the uh, autobiography stood for. So this is the top of the line, long wheelbase, $218,300. Well, I'm not done with my, my mini rant. Okay. Autobiography is kind of a silly name to name a trim, don't you think? An autobiography is an account of a person's life when written by that person. So that's your rant? Well, what does it have to do with the top of the line Range Rover? Uh, or actually near top of the line now, I suppose. Well, and, and like I said, this model SV, and then there's something that, that designates it as the special back seats where you get the two back seats mm. that have. And I, I don't remember that. I, I did the review, and I don't remember exactly what it's called. I've already forgotten it. So I, I agree. It would be like, you know, much smarter if this were an American car company. They'd be like the Range Rover top dog. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or it would be like I remember me, that. I would remember that. Be like, let me introduce you to the new Lexus LX memoir. <laughs> or, you know, the Ford Falcon Fiction. Like, well, why are you naming the top trim after a classification of literature? Well, I was uh, on my run this morning, and I know you guys are surprised I run, but I was on my run, and I was thinking about uh, the new Toyota Electric vehicle, mm-hmm. which is called what? The the uh, It's a serial number. It's like BZ. BZ4X. All right, you, there it you, is. You even had to think hard. I did. But it's not BZ4X. It's actually BZ4XLEAWD. <laughs> that's that's the official. So you're thinking so BZ four X X L E A W D. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, so, it so just I, keeps going. I was thinking like the way the Toyota came up with that is they took just a bunch of dice with random letters and numbers <laughs> on them and threw them on the table and I thought maybe we could like do a podcast where we get those same dice and then come up with names for cars like that. Just and then charge the manufacturers <laughs> exactly, yeah, for the names. Because that's the way it is, really. It's a good idea. Yeah. Now, BZ stands for Beyond Zero. Yes, I know. Four is a size, I know, I and know. X is a crossover. Yeah, EXO. Uh, okay, B. autobiography is better than BZ4X. Right, I'm but, just, this, but this is SV. Well, yeah. I, th- I swear autobiography Sign- was the top. it's like Signature Suite is the official name of it or something <laughs> like that. Seriously. So if you look at the log wheelbase ones, I'm looking at it on the website. It yeah. goes autobiography, then first to Edition, yes. the Range Rover SV. Yes. So I learned something new. I appreciate you, you teaching me that. That but was there's more to it. Like I said, it's more. It just keeps going, huh? Yeah. So I, I did drive uh, uh, both of those models that mm-hmm. you just described, uh, and uh, this model is just so luxurious. I mean, uh, yeah, they've taken it to the next level, and I, I suppose that's because when you think about it, they're really competing with cars like the um, Cullinan. Well, 
I think they're aiming at calling in Bentayga. Yeah, I was going to say G-Wagon, too. Yeah, G-Wagon, that's a good one. You know? I think with this generation, Range Rover has figured out that they can charge a lot more money than they've been charging in the past for these special editions. This one is the most expensive Range Rover ever. Oh, I don't think there's ever been a more expensive one. 218,000. But they're looking... Starting 218. Starting. They're looking at what's happening with um, the, like, the the, uh, Lamborghini. Yes. The Urus, right? Those are selling, like, hotcakes. Another another competitor to this. So what they did was, which is interesting... I'm looking... At, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm looking at the th- there's themes on the SV. There's the SV Intrepid exterior, yeah. and then there's the SV Serenity exterior. No, is that that, that not what you're thinking of? Uh, it's, it's another word for it. anyway. It could have been a Serenity. Um, anyway, what they did was to make it powerful. They, they you know once upon a time BMW owned Range Rover. You know that, and now they are placing 4.4 liter V8 twin turbos under the hood of that vehicle. Well, that, yes, that which, was kind Which is a BMW sourced engine. <laughs> so when BMW purchased uh, the Rover Group, right? Yes. Um, I think part of that Rover Group acquisition was Land Rover and Range Rover. Yes. And then for a while there in the L322 model lineup of Range Rover, they put the old 4.4 V8 from the X5 in it. Do you remember that? I remember, yeah. What an absolute disaster that turned out yeah. to be. Um, that was a horrible engine for longevity. Um, and then eventually, right, uh, BMW sold it to Ford, and then Ford started doing the the um, the, the V8, the, yes. the, the, the other V8, the Jaguar Land Rover V8. And that was better. Supercharged. So yeah, yeah, there was a supercharged model too. But I'm wondering if this new V8 is going to be better. I sure hope it is. Well, how many horsepower? Take a guess. A lot. Well, what do you think? Give me a number. 490. 523. Oh, it's pretty close. Yeah. You That's a lot close. of power. And now, what, the, do you, what do you think the 0 to 60 is, um, according to Range Rover? On the super it. yacht, probably yeah. 9 seconds. No, 4.5. On that? Yeah. That'll do 0 to 60, 4.5? 4.5. It's There's the a, size of a small suburb. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Wow. I don't know what the fuel economy is, but I'm sure it's... Well, it's got two turbos, right? Yes. Mm. 523 horsepower. Is yeah. Good. That's pretty cool. And yeah. the uh, there's also the plug-in hybrid coming. There is, yeah, which is going to be more expensive, I think. Well, I, it's is gonna, it? <laughs> it's going to have, I think uh, it's going to have, now I don't remember if they, see, they, they gave us, this is why it's very confusing, because this was the international launch. Mm-hmm. So everything was in kilometers, millimeters, uh, and such. So, like, I asked a ground clearance, and I think they said 140 millimeters, 140 millimeters. Oh, sure, right? 140. Yeah, I was like, Absolutely. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Maybe you're just not sophisticated enough to understand and the, and the Range Rover lore. And then they said in the in the plug-in hybrid, you're either going to get 40 miles or 40 kilometers. And there's a big difference between, <laughs> between the two. One, one of those two numbers, I think, is correct. Is that, so I apologize to all of our listeners and viewers. Did they really I, say that? Yes. Is that based on how you drive it, or is that like... No, that's what they told me, but I, I forget if it was if they had converted oh, it to miles. So it's not their fault. It's your fault yeah, that I you forgot. forgot. Yeah, because because <laughs> everything was in, like for the most part, everything was in. So now my brain doesn't remember whether that particular number was in kilometers or. That's funny. Here, do you want me to look it up? And I also think it was on the European cycle. Um, Forty-eight miles on the PHEV, and it's got DC fast charging. It probably is on the European cycle. Yeah, but so, so that's why I think I went to forty miles because he was like, "That's on the European cycle, and that's going to go down to like forty when you get." So forty-eight. Miles miles, but that could go down to 40. Right. So when you uh, drove this thing, mm. did they do enough to change it from the old one? Because visually it looks very similar, except for the rear, which is beautiful. Yeah, you know what it feels like? It feels like they took the old one and just kind of did, where they stretched the face out, right? Like dog in space kind of, where they just smoothed everything out. Dog in space. Dog in space. Do that to your dog where you like take his face and just pull it back and it looks like he's Oh, jeez. Why would you do that to Blazy? I would just do it gently. Okay. Just dog in just, you know, Dog in What I'm doing to myself right now. What, what you're doing is you're giving yourself a Kim Kat Kardashian facelift yes. is what you're doing. So that's what it looks you like. You know, maybe. like the cut thing where they like stretch it over your face. And get this, you know what's unique about that one? It's It's got white carpets. No, it's got not one, but two refrigerators. That's a lot of fridges. It's probably too many. Well, it's like one probably too many. one too many fridges. So there's one in the armrest, mm-hmm. and that one in the armrest has not one, but two different temperature uh, coldnesses. So there's a little blue, light, blue button that lights up, and you can go one or two. Uh, in terms of how cold you want it. And, of course, there's a fridge in the back, which is big enough to hold two champagne flutes. I believe they're called and a champagne bottle. Mm. I have to say, I think it's a very good-looking SUV. It is. Especially the facelift. And I really am excited about that V8 twin turbo from BMW because that, in my opinion, is an excellent engine. Yeah. Now, in my video, I showed the really coolest thing about this, right? And I think this is also designed for China. By the way, uh, unlike many other vehicles, um, this is still sold more in the U.S. than in China. So oh, really? we still buy more of these than the Chinese. I wonder, did you ask them where they sell the most of them? Yeah. 
America. What state? Take yeah, it. that's what I'm asking. Take oh, Texas. On. Where was the launch? Um, it was oh, look, you know, it was in picture. Reno, Nevada. Look at the picture. What's Re behind? Reno. It? Is that Reno? No. Is that Fresno? No. It's Sonoma. Oh, Sonoma. Yeah. So they sell the most in California. Sonoma, Idaho. Ca California. <laughs> uh, and the coolest thing about it is one of the screens is uh, like an air purity screen. So it tells you the number of particulates that are on the outside of the Range Rover Very and the cool. number that are on the inside of the Range Rover. Then you can actually like biohazard. Uh, clean the interior and then the coolest part is it tells you the exterior air quality and then it tells you the exterior air quality of your location where you're going because it pings through using its you know onboard internet uh, a weather station that actually gives you the information about how clean the air is so not only do you know the interior air quality but the exterior and the exterior quality of where your navigation is going to now would you say that it is a squishy ride no it's very, the old one was very squishy. I like the squishy. This one is squishy but controlled. Well, that that's what manufacturers say when they firm it them was. up. It was. It was squishy. Squishy but con controlled. Well, it depends. You know, you got different drive modes, right? It's like Lance Armstrong in a, in a lazy bear, a lazy boy chair. It's squishy, but he's got a lot of control. That's a really weird analogy. That's a really good analogy. I, a, I thought that was brilliant. You know what the craziest thing about that is? Hmm. It's got uh, a Range Rover slash uh, Land Rovers, right? JLR. It's Jaguar Land Rover, uh, Range Rover, uh, which is also very confusing. But it's got their uh, off-road cred. So you can, and this is crazy, in a $218,000 car, get a low range mm -hmm. and, get this, a locking center and rear diff. Wow. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah, you can get a locking rear diff. Not that anybody's going to take that off-road, but I did. Uh, and it was really capable. I and, bet. And it comes from the factory on 22s, but we were rolling on 23s. <laughs> did they have you off-road on 23s, or did they put like they, 19s uh, no, on it? Actually, it comes in 20s. You can get 22s and 23s. We off-roaded on 23s, which means, <laughs> which means you have about as much sidewall uh, as a pregnant aunt. Yes. <laughs> which is not a lot. <laughs> which is not ideal. But then it's got this incredible air suspension that actually works. So even though you're on these very... A low profile, about as low profile and about as wide of a tire as you can get, and about as big of a wheel as you can get from anywhere, uh, it still is comfortable, believe it or not. So I really loved it. I thought it was really well executed. Now, the comments, of course, in my video all were just wait, you know, that's going to be a $50,000 car next year, which it won't be. Oh, no. No. But, it won't be. You know, as we know, um, JLR does not have the most stellar reputation for long term reliability. Uh, and so we are um, not doing a long-term review of it because I only drove it for a day and a half. The thing is, though, which I think is very interesting, right, is, um, you know, I see that comment a lot, like this thing's going to depreciate quickly. And that may be so, but they still sell every single one they can make. These are hugely popular in areas like Beverly Hills, Los Angeles. Um, head out to the East Coast. You see these all over in Boston and New York, these full-size Range Rovers. So even though... Um, some folks are saying, you know, they depreciate quickly. That may have been true in the past, but people are still very much willing to spend the big money to buy these. Because not only do you have the status, but you got the comfort. You do have the capability if you're crazy enough to get the one with the rear locker. And I love it. I think it's a great looking vehicle. I liked your video. You did a good video. You know who's gunning for this? Who? Uh, uh, the Lexus LX600. That's a good they, point. They are gunning for it, like, directly. They even have, like, this one was a four-seater that we're looking at. Why mm -hmm. with those, like first class airplane seats in the back um, yeah and that's that's where really uh the lexus aims to go um and uh, yeah i mean you could you can recline that seat there's like a this is a cool thing um they actually have a motorized cup holder why do you need that so you push a button and the top opens up and the cup holder slowly and gently lifts itself out of the center console that's a little much yeah yeah i'm not sure that's fully needed but um uh, yeah, it's. Uh, you didn't like my Lance Armstrong and Lazy Lazy Boy. No, I wasn't. I wasn't in love with it. Well, well, how would you describe the ride quality? Uh, I would describe it comfortable but athletic. I would describe it like an elephant on a Segway. Oh wait, that's way better. I totally understand that one. <laughs> thank you for thank you for elaborating there. If it was a four wheel, so is it? it drive does it, Segway. I think it has four wheel steering too, right? It does have four wheel steering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the thing. So like. Uh, big cars, uh, SUVs are having their moment right now. For some reason, every manufacturer has decided that they need to have a big vehicle. Uh, oh, it also tows, oh, God, 3,700 uh, kilograms or 3,900 kilograms. I think it's 3,900 kilograms. Okay. So multiply that by 2.2 and you get like 8,000 pounds. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it tows a lot. So it will tow your horse trailer or your uh, Cimarron if you happen to be of that uh, financial uh, class where you actually have a $175,000 horse trailer with living quarters. Mm. But I suppose if you have 218000 you might have a Cimarron. So uh, would you recommend it over the oh, Lexus? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, over the Lexus? I don't know. That's a good I, I like the styling of this much more than Lexus. Uh, but the Lexus also has really good off-road cred, you know. So for me, it's all about off-roading. And I know that's stupid because people aren't taking these off-road. Uh, I just think there's some magic that the Range Rover has that Lexus still hasn't been able to capture. Mm. You know, if I could get, uh, uh, sorry, Lexus and Toyota, but if I can get a Land Cruiser, I would buy that over either of these. But since you're no longer importing the Land Cruiser and I'm stuck with the Lexus, I'd rather get a Range Rover. But don't you think it's a slightly different customer? You know, the, like a Land Cruiser customer. How this about, is how about an Escalade customer? Yeah, an Escalade is a good customer. Yeah, yeah or a Navigator. Because the the Land Cruiser is a fantastic vehicle. To get me wrong, but that's not going to appeal to someone who I think is looking for the status of the Range Rover brand, right? The Toyota badge does not hold nearly the same kind of luxury luxury uh, vibe as the Range Rover. Yeah, you're, you're probably correct, Tommy. I, I think I have to agree with you on that. Uh, you know, there, like I said, there, you know. Uh, personally, right now, uh, if I were getting one of these big people haulers, I'd probably just get a, a Z71 Tahoe. It's mm. kind of it's kind of where I'm at. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the the thing about this vehicle, even though I love it and I, I I love driving in it and I love being driven in it, it just feels really ostentatious. And I feel like you know, like I don't wear expensive watches like some people. Or now, like watches are really hot right now, right? Like a Rolex or a, a Philippe, uh, whatever the heck that is. I can't pronounce the part. These are very expensive and very showy watches, and, and I just feel awkward, uh, you know, wearing an expensive watch. Just like feel awkward driving an expensive car. I feel like I feel like I'm putting on airs. I'm not that person. Does that make sense? I do. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I love I love the fact that we're journalists and we get to drive them and be ridden in them, but we don't own them. So it's not like you know you you got the kind of the get out of jail free card. Like if somebody comes up to you and says, "Oh, you're driving a Range Rover," and you're like, "No, nah, dude, I'm just." Borrowing it. Although people like that, oh, you're driving a Range Rover. They do. Plenty Some of people yeah. do. But that's why I moved to Colorado. I didn't want that. So should we move on to our next segment? Yes, let's move on to our next segment, which are the best cars we've driven recently. Well, we're going to answer a couple questions before then. Okay, let's go for it. You got so, some questions? Yep. So if you want to send us a question about car life, uh, marriage now apparently, feel free to send us an email, info at tflcar.com, and we will answer your question right here on the TFL Talk podcast. This question comes from Marcos, and he is looking for a new overlander. He wants to gear up for light camping, nothing too extreme, skid plate, suspension, and maybe a lift. He's looking to keep for at least five or 10 years he's not in a hurry and he's looking at a lexus he says the lexus dealer doesn't charge him over msrp but it's going to be a few months wait he's looking at a gx 460 or he's also looking to wait for a 2022 sequoia trd pro and says feel free to suggest additional options i would like to have a little luxury and a quiet ride in town a 2004 volkswagen Touareg. <laughs> <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, well, that's certainly a cheaper option. <laughs> Until it breaks. <laughs> no, I have the perfect option. Uh, LR3. Um, yes, actually. <laughs> that's a very good option. Yeah, 2006 through 09 LR3. Uh, you know, we were just talking about Land Rover reliability, and they yeah. do have a reputation. That, those, those three years of the LR3 are bulletproof. They're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. Everybody, everybody, looking at the camera now. Look at me, I am your captain now. Everybody needs to buy an 06 through 09 LR3 at some point in their life. It will go 250,000 miles. Like genuinely, I know guys in the club that have like 250, 280 on them. Yeah, but don't get a 2010 and don't get a 2000. No, don't go no 05, five. Yeah. yeah. Don't do either of those. Well, LR4s are fine too, but they're not as yeah. not as bulletproof. But yeah, that's a great option. Oh, so he wants a new car, I take it. No, right? I, he needs a 99 Suburban. Oh, God. It's the only vehicle that ever needs to exist. It is. It might even be better than the LR3. It's dirt reliable. It's dirt cheap. You can get it with leather seats. You can get it with heated seats. That's the answer. Save yourself $65,000. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so we're doing a series, guys, that we'll be airing starting next month. I'm going to do a little promo for that. Uh, you know, we've done the series called uh, No Payment Needed. Uh, and uh, we always kind of give ourselves a budget and go buy uh, cars or trucks uh, under a certain figure. And this time we decided to go big. Mm -hmm. uh, so we bought three vehicles, which are Overlander potential, right? So we bought an Excursion, yep. a Suburban, and an Escalade. 
Right. Uh, and we turned them into budget overlanders and took them and ran the White Room Trail with them in Moab. Uh, so be sure to check that out. That's going to be on TFL Truck, but the easiest way to find that is on all tfl.com where we have all of our videos podcasts tiktoks news stories uh anyway uh th- so that's going to start to air in may and there's five episodes so maybe you can watch that maybe you'd like one of those but if you want a new one the problem with the new overlander is um the same problem with this right and that is taking any of these very expensive let's say that you go the budget route and you forget about the gx but you wait a little bit and get the uh, uh sequoia the new sequoia right which mm-hmm. is which comes after because it's, it's gonna have the same um, twin turbo powertrain. It's going to be basically the same underneath as uh, the new LX, right? Yeah, or the Tundra. Or the Tundra. Mm-hmm. So let's say you go for the budget. It's still going to be like a sixty thousand dollar vehicle. Right. Right. And that is very painful to take off road because you will damage it. So if you have no issues in getting, you know, pinstriping, getting rock chips, uh, getting, uh, well, gosh, remember how dirty those cars were when we took them on the white room? I mean, I mean, that, we, we, I think we, we took half of Moab's red dirt with us. That's true. Yeah, everything is just covered in dirt. Yes. And I, I have a hard time with the new car doing that. It just hurts me to, like, completely uh, take a new vehicle and cover it in dirt and scratches and rock chips and you know uh, we, you're, gonna, you're gonna also you're gonna damage the wheels that just happens well what if he instead of going like LX Sequoia what if he goes a little bit more down market and gets like a loaded forerunner there we go that's an idea not quite as comfy right not quite as maybe maybe modern as a Sequoia on the inside but still you can get it with nice upholstery and some good features look, look, I would just look at like a previous generation Tahoe just wait. Go one, go back one gen. Or an L or a GX. Sorry. Yeah. Or or a pre, or the GXs are you know they become the 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 it overlander and so <laughs> everybody wants them and they're really expensive. Uh, but like a like a previous gen Tahoe Z seventy one will do it. Mm. You don't think I so? I don't like those newer Tahoes. The previous gen. Yeah. You want to go back two gens? You want to go well, like the yeah, square headlight? Well, yeah, because the newer Tahoes are just the, they don't feel like they're as well accustomed to off road terrain. So I was just at uh, our local Chevy dealership buying yeah. a new um, truck. Uh huh. Um, by the time this airs, you'll know that we have bought. Drum roll! You want to tell them what we bought? Well, yeah, the ZR2 Silverado. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. What do you think of it? Um, I think it's very hearing aid beige. I'd like to discuss no. that color choice with you. No, it's military grade. Oh, is it? Yes. Military it's, grade just means it's made from the cheapest stuff that it's going to cost the taxpayers like, the least amount like, of money. It's like the Desert Fox, Rommel, military, you know, like like off-road sandy color. Is that why it has a chrome 6.2 liter badge on the hood? Did Rommel appreciate a little bit of chrome on the hood of his, on the of his command tanks, vehicles? <laughs> So you don't like the color? I'm not. I'm not super sold on the color. Okay. Fair um, enough. No, actually, I, I I do like it. You know, it's the same color as the Gladiator we had, which was phenomenal. I do love the look of it, though. I think it did a great job with the style. I like the the territory tires and the the big openings on the wheel wells and the front bumper is pretty cool. And I'm really excited about the off road tech. So yeah, I think it's going to be a cool truck. So anyway, I was there and talking to him about the new uh, Yukon or uh, Suburban mm-hmm. or Tahoe. They can't even get them. I mean, they're pre-sold out like sure. six months. I believe it. And and uh, the, one of the guys was telling me a story about a customer who came in and had just spent. So the cars are like sixty thousand, and mm-hmm. they had just spent like seventy thousand on like the previous like a three-year-old one with fifteen thousand miles, uh, and they wanted to upgrade to a new one. And where we buy our vehicles, Johnsons, they don't sell both sticker, which yep. is why we buy their vehicles there. And so he's like, I can get you a newer one for cheaper, but this woman had just gone to a different dealership and and bought a more expensive one apparently. Wow. Yeah, use. So uh, they're kind of unobtainium right now, uh, but I really like the new generation of, of those GM SUVs. They put air suspension on them. Uh, they've actually, you know, given them a little bit of real off road cred, right? We took the Tahoe Z71 up Webster Pass, if you recall. Right, but that's the new one. Yeah. The old one, I'm not so sure. Yeah, so if you can get a new one, get a new one. The new one is really good. I do yeah. like the new one a lot. Yeah. Uh, the old one, like the Z71 just wasn't wasn't that special mm. in my mind. Um, I did they, they think they did a Z71 in the previous gen, right? And if you're curious about our new um, ZR2 uh, Silverado, uh, we've done, at this point, uh, we right now when we're recording this, we have a number of time to listen to this. We've actually done uh, three videos with it. Uh, uh, and uh, the one that I'm really looking forward to is the one where we go underneath and take it to our master mechanic, Toby, and look underneath it and see what they have done. Because really, uh, what you're paying for are those shocks, right? Those multimatic, um, big, bigger shocks that you get on the Colorado, but now they've scaled them up. 
Now, what I think you should also consider is the Forerunner, great choice. And I'd also look at, if you want a little bit of luxury and comfort, the new um, Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. Mm. I drove that uh, in the short wheelbase form. It was really, really good off-road, especially with the uh, the Trailhawk trim and the, the Trick li Limited Slipper Differential and the Sway Bar Disconnect. It was really pretty phenomenal. So I definitely look into that too. From a longevity standpoint though, if you just want to be big and comfy and last a long time, the All Lexus right. GX is still a good right, option. Let me throw another one out there. Grand Wagoneer. No. Why? Uh, no. It's, That's also no, in this class. No, Grand Wagoneer, it, it's just, I just don't like it very much. Really? I don't like the, the yeah. suspension setup very much so, for so, off-roading. So here's another interesting piece of reporting I can talk, talk to you about. So I was at Johnson's, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they have... A, you know, have a bunch of them, and they're having a hard time selling them because that's kind of they, they kind of specialize in doing a lot of fleet business, yep. right? Um, and uh, a lot of people are turned off by that body colored B and C pillar. He did not say that. That's why they're not buying them. No, no, that's that's what I said. Right. And well, I asked him. He said yes. A lot of people are. They don't just, like the B and the C pillar. Yeah, that they're body colored. I'm telling you, the then, body colored was a bold move. And then I was here at our local Boulder dealership, the Jeep dealership. Uh, and the sales manager there told me, Fowler, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they told me that they can sell every single one of them that they can buy. Oh. So it's funny. I think it depends on, like, Boulder's probably more affluent. Yeah, so. it might depend on price, too, because a Grand Wagoneer is going to be 90, 100 grand. Both dealerships told me that they do not sell cars over sticker. So both Fowler That's here cool. in Boulder and uh, Johnson's do not sell vehicles over sticker. And he said, if I can get more Grand Wagoneers, I would sell every single one of them. Wagoneers or Grand Wagoneers? Grand Wagoneers, sorry. Okay, the big sorry, ones. Yeah, the Grand Wagoneers. Um, I mean, the expensive ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't like the Grand Wagoneer very much. I don't, I don't, I think it's just really big and kind of cumbersome to drive. That's another one that competes with us. Yeah, it just it doesn't feel right to be in a $110,000 Jeep. I just don't, I don't. I don't get that very very much, but um, it's also got really big wheels, and the four-wheel drive system is okay, but it's not, like, super phenomenal. All right, all right so let me ask you uh, this. So now we've gone over a bunch of, like, big we, – we, of course, haven't talked about the Happy Hippo, right, which is Infinity. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, – the, what is it called now? The QX80? Uh, yeah, what are they, yeah, I think it's a QX. They renamed it. Mm -hmm. So we haven't talked about that, and we haven't talked about the Armada, which is, you know – Yeah, the Armada's a, good. N Nissan's version of it. Uh, what else have we forgotten that we haven't talked about in these? And our mod, actually, we took it off-road uh, last year, uh, and it did really well, actually. So that might be another one you might want to take a look at, and that might actually be gettable. Uh, Explore and Expedition, they have that new Timberline there trim. Is, there is a new Timberline. And, of course, I just got off of the program driving the new Navigator. That's right. Which is which is another one. A little bit more luxury, though. He's looking for kind of an Overland style. I, I would think the, 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 the Navigator kind of competes with the Grand Wagoneer Series 3. Right. Whereas, uh, like, you know, the – what's the one below it? The uh, av Aviator. Right. Uh, probably competes more with the Wagoneer. Does that make sense? This might Not, be a little smaller. Yeah, no, because w it would be – The Aviator competes with the Grand no, Cherokee. Whoa. What would you say? So here's what you do. You do. So, so you got the premium full-size SUVs. Right. So that's the Navigator. That is Escalade. the Escalade. The, the Yukon, that is – Yukon Denali. Uh, sort of, but yeah, that's es yeah, that's yeah. Escalade though. But that's no, the same but, platform. But, but but it's still it's still their premium. So those are like the premium ones, and then you've got the volume ones. So you've got Expedition competes right. with the um, like the Tahoe Suburban lineup, yeah. right? So Expedition is a little bit lower, and that competes with Wagoneer. So Grand Wagoneer's Lexus. Okay, how about the how about the Expedition? The, uh, what's the one uh, the uh, the one that's off roady? The Timberline. The Timberline. Yeah, we just saw that at the Chicago. I don't outside. know. I've never driven it. Yeah. Hey Ford. Uh, please be so kind and uh, send us an Expedition Timberline. We'd really love to take it off-road. Or an Explorer Timberline. Yeah, we haven't touched either of them. Yeah, we haven't touched either of them. But uh, I'm not sure those have. Do those have low ranges? Uh, I think the Expedition might. I know the Explorer doesn't, but the Expedition, Expedition might. might have a low range, yeah. Anyway, it's crazy, like I said, that this thing has a low range and a locking center and rear diff. That's I think you can get a low range in the Grand Wagoneer, though. So it's not the only no, it's luxury not the only. one model. You can get a low range in the Navigator. Uh, really? Oh, yeah, you can. It's an option. Never mind. Yeah, it's I was going to say. But you know what they did? They buried it. It's like a special package that gets it. So you can't, like, say, hey, I want the low range. With the Navigator, you have to say, I want the, and there's a specific, like, either custom model or something that comes with a low range. But okay. It's, it's not standard on the vehicle. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Well, we kind of got into the weeds there. Um, no, so I, I think we got, this is cool. We got talking about what, the what, big ass. What should he buy? 
Uh, He's looking at a GX. 2004 Volkswagen <laughs> Turek. Yeah, there you go. And a AAA membership. No, <laughs> I you, mean. If you can't get what you should buy from all that commentary and review. Well, we didn't really good. give him a lot of advice, did we? Well, what of all those vehicles? He's, he's only buying one vehicle. What should he get? I think, you know, so here's the secret. Could, could I do a rant again? My other rant? Sure. So people always, you know, ask us. This isn't really a rant. It's just, it's just a fact. So people come to us and they say, hey, I'm looking at, uh, let's call it an LX, or in his case, maybe a Sequoia, right? And then they give us all these criteria. What should I buy? And really what they want from us, which we have figured out over what, 12 years of doing this, is not a real answer for another vehicle. What they want us to say is, you know, the vehicle that you've chosen is perfect for you. And basically give them, in essence, kind of professional permission to go buy that thing. Or uh, give them, you know, a reason to go buy it. And then in the past, every time I've come up with other vehicles that they can look at, and this has been either people who've emailed us or my friends or like acquaintances, right? They always come back to the vehicle that they suggested. So they'll throw the question out. Here are some suggestions. What do you think I should buy? And then the best answer is always, I think the one that you've got lined up is the perfect one for you. So both of those cars are perfect. You pick, which, pick whichever one fits your budget. That's my serious, and both of them are perfect. What I mean, an, yes, an incredibly dull answer. But that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, the, but the, it's absolutely the truth. If you were in his position. I'd buy one of those two. Because that's what he wants. But, people, look, people <laughs> buy cars not because, look, here's the thing, right? Women sometimes, I think, and this is going to be more, uh, more. Uh, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm just not going to go there because it's going gonna, it's gonna to create controversy. I don't want to do that. People, let's just go people, okay? People, men and women, so I'm rephrasing it, men and women buy cars for, because they want them, right? Uh, and then they use, more often than not, a rationale to justify what they want. Right? It's never like, here's what I want, here's what I need, so I'm going to buy this. It's always, you know, here's what I want, and now I need a rationale to make sure that that's exactly right. Okay. And that's people. That's not, I'm not going to, that's exactly what that is. Well, so that's the sound of everybody tuning out at this point. But okay, it, fair just, if, Sorry, you, guys. if you were in his position, this is, just take Marcos out of it. If you were in his position and you wanted a new, uh, Daily Driver slash Overlander, brand new. A 2000, I told you my answer. I would, I would buy a 2004 Volkswagen Touring. I love that car. Well, I, I will actually give it, you, I, I will give Marcus some actual useful I advice. It. I miss it. I would get a new Forerunner, like a nice one with, with all the bells and goodies. I think okay. that's a great choice. Plus, you can get it dirty and there's huge aftermarket support. So that would be my choice, a Forerunner. I think look, the GX you, is a little ritzy. You, you think I'm being disingenuous. I'm being absolutely uh, No, honest. it's it's a very... It's a, it's a $6,000 car. If you got enough money for $55,000, you probably got enough money for $6,000, right? So buy the $6,000 car, wheel the balls out of it, scratch it up, get it dirty, right? Throw on some KO2s, have fun with it. And when it breaks, you know, either find a cheap mechanic to fix it or move it out to the next person who We'll fix it and then use whatever other new vehicle you have to drive to work, to take the kids to school, church, yada, yada, yada. That's what I would do. Well, first of all, they're fifteen thousand dollars cars in this market now. They really blew up in value. <laughs> eh, those Touregs are still because they break. Oh, you want a Toureg? Yeah. Oh, that's a terrible choice. <laughs> that's a horrible choice. I think we're talking LR3. No, or LR3. Same yeah, thing. LR3. Not, same e thing. Same thing. Very different I, thing. I, 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 well, Touareg bigger, looks like a tiny suppository look, compared to an LR3. Bigger, you can do three row, right? Yes. So that's that. So do the you want a three row? Do the Touareg. So now it's like a ten thousand. We when we bought Do the ours, Touareg three row. No, I mean do the do the <laughs> LR3. It was like what seven thousand and a half when we bought it. Now it's probably like you're right ten. The, to, the Land Rover. Yeah. All right, so now I'm going to give you the real advice. Um, I definitely would look at either the new Forerunner or the new Grand Cherokee um, if you're looking for a new with a warranty. I think both of those are very rugged and very capable. The GX is a great choice, but especially when they're new, they're expensive and hard to modify um, comparatively to like a Forerunner. So that is where I am going with that. So you need, the problem with the Touareg is it's a two-row, right? And you want a three-row. Well, the problem with the, 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 the Touareg is it's a 15-year-old German car. So, so, so throw on a rooftop tent, throw the kids in the tent. They'll love it up there. Yes. So going down the highway, they'll have a they'll have a hoot up there. And then when you're broken down in the middle of the desert for 15 days, you can eat and one the of the dog. Throw the dog up you there. You can too. eat one of the kids, right? <laughs> the, the, look, the Touareg is a as an Oh, Touareg now. Touareg. Well, if you want to get technical, but it's a fantastic vehicle, one of my favorite of all time. Yeah. You have to be an enthusiast to own it. All I right. think it's a terrible thing to recommend somebody. All right, well, let's get to the best cars we've driven now. I think we've done enough ranting and raging and arguing. Uh, so <laughs> so we just had uh, and it's funny 
I was just thinking to myself, once again, this morning on the run, like last year at this time, we couldn't get our hands on electric cars. So we ended up having to buy a bunch of Teslas so we could review electric cars. Mm -hmm. And we bought the Mini SE. Now our, our parking lot is being flooded by electric cars from the manufacturers. Thank you very much. We love the fact that we're actually getting to uh, drive these electric cars. And I got to say, Tommy, these new electric cars are as good. Uh, if not better, dare I say it, and please don't send your hate, Tesla fans. I know you're rabid, and I know you you know, hang on every word that Mr. Musk says, but the new EV6 by Kia is a better car than a Tesla Model Y. It's an excellent automobile. Yes, yes it is. Is it better than a Model Y? Well, I think it depends. Okay, okay. on what? Um, I mean, it depends on your use case. I think, the, I mean, the big advantage that Tesla has is still the supercharger network. Right, if you're going to go cross-country, go with a Tesla. Just... Because of the convenience. Yeah, I mean, I that, that EV6 charges at 240 kilowatts or some crazy how number. How far did you get? How fast did you do the charging test on Yeah, it? I did 10 to 80% in about 20 minutes, which was phenomenal. Look, I, I walked by that car when it first was delivered here, and I did not a double, but a triple take. It is such a gorgeous vehicle. I mean, it is Coke bottle shaped. It is low. It is sleek. Uh, I love that kind of like uh, V lighting signature that's not connected, but it's got little like dashes. Uh, I love the interior design. The only thing I hate about it is that front A pillar is so low that I have a hard time getting in and out of it, and sometimes I hit my uh, forehead on the A pillar. It's from a car standpoint, I agree. It, I think it's better than a Model Y in just about every way. But of course, you have to consider the supercharger network. But because I don't do a lot of EV road trips, because I just don't do a lot of road trips in general, I would get the Kia all day long. It's got some of the best looks on the market. It's got an incredible interior, really very easy to use overall. It's plenty quick for what it is. We had the wind all-wheel drive with the 320 horsepower dual motor setup, and it was like 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds. It'll blow the doors off 99% of cars on the road. It's got plenty of range, 274 miles according to the EPA, and the charging was the best charging I've ever experienced personally from 10 to 80%, and just 20 minutes was off the wall good. So um, really, really, really like the car a lot. So you've driven both, right? You've driven the EV6 and its uh, twin brother or sister, uh, the Ionic 5, the Hyundai. You have a drum both? Yes. Which would you rather get? I would personally get the Hyundai. Really? Why? Well, because it's got a higher roof line. That is my biggest complaint on the Kia, is that, like you mentioned, the roof line is just too low. The windshield a little bit too slanted, I think, for taller drivers. Too the, the Hyundai doesn't look quite as crazy. I, I actually personally prefer the looks of the Ionic. I think it looks like an, like an 80s hot hatch. Yeah, it's got a bit of a retro feel. But it's got a more roomy kind of driving experience, so mm. that would be my choice. But that eGMP platform is just great. If you haven't driven a, the, the Ionic 5 or the EV6, just go take an afternoon and just go drive them they're that good yeah unfortunately dealers are asking five to ten k over that but, is the that is the bad part yeah but I'm, I'm seeing them on the road which is pretty cool i'm seeing them everywhere i've yeah. been seeing a ton of ionic fives yeah and of course model y is still i think the, the big player in that, that that room but when you consider a model y right it's going to be in a lot of cases 55 60 grand um the hyundai starts like what, 40 or something? So way cheaper, and you get a lot of the same goodies for a lot less money. All right, well, um, is it my turn to do a rant now? We're, We've I'm done like to... three rants. No, that was just commentary. I'll do a rant. Well, you've done three of them. No, no. I'll you do... did the rant about the Marcus so, guy. So you did the rant this, about the white carpet. This, this really belongs. That was not a rant. That was just, come on. Who's gonna white, who's, it was a white carpet. I don't know. Who's going to disagree with Barry Manilow. The white Barry Manilow probably enjoys the white carpet. Oh, that is an older reference than me, Tommy. <laughs> that, is, that reference is as old as you. <laughs> he was around when you were a kid. <laughs> He's still around. Uh, so uh, I was going to do this video, but maybe we'll still do it. And it's a truck video, right? Uh, but recently, uh, there were, came some, during, during Tesla's um, Gigafactory or whatever it was, Texas Factory Day, right? Uh, they, they unveiled the latest version of the Cybertruck, and it has not aged well. I'm sorry, all you Tesla fans, I'm looking at the camera. If you're listening, that truck is butt ugly, Tommy. It is just butt ugly. And it's gotten worse over, uh, the, over time now that they've actually had to put, like, real bumpers on it and rear Real, real tires and rear wheels, real wheels and rear, re, I keep saying rear, but real uh, side mirrors. Uh, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like they built it 
uh, when uh, we thought, you know what happened? This, this is what I think happened. They built it when like the dystopian future was cool, like when it was like a Mad Max future, where, like when you'd be like on the front of a guitar, on the front of a truck, you know, playing guitar with like flame shooting out the back, right? That that that's the kind of the, the mentality that it was built for, right? And when they unveiled it, of course, they took that ball and smashed it into the window, and they said that it's going to be bulletproof and yada yada yada. So they built this very like dystopian future. And then, of course, the Russians invaded Ukraine, and we all got to see what that future could really look like. And people were like, you know what? It's not that cool. It kind of sucks to live in a, in a world where you have to have a car that's bulletproof, because chances are that's not going to be a lot of fun, and a lot of innocent people are going to you know, die, and a lot of innocent children are going to die. So I think, I think they really like missed the boat on the design language of that truck. And now it just reminds me of the horrors of war instead of the coolness of the dystopian future. Uh, that is way too much analysis. Well, that's where I'm at with it. Way too much analysis. Plus, it's uh, like the, the, that, that cut line above the bumper. You is know horrible. what happened? What? You know what happened? Three what years happened? ago, they launched a vehicle that looked like a tent parked on top of a table. <laughs> no. And three years later, it still looks like a tent parked on do, top do of a table. you have a picture of it? Are you looking at it? I've seen it. No, bring up the latest pictures. You'll see what I mean. First. I know. It looks like a tent parked up on a table, but now it has mirrors. It's the same truck. It's just, no, no, It was hideous when they launched it. It's even more hideous now. No, it's, it's just a terrible design. It's just, yeah, it's just like, it, it, it's just... It, I mean, I don't think... I, I appreciate your your very um, or, or Orwellian, 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 yes, Orwellian analysis of, of why of what the, the, the... Of the design language. But of it the, looked uh, like poo when it launched. It still looks like poo, so I don't know what people the... People lost their, you know what, poo when the thing was unveiled. The Tesla fanboys lost their poo. I think most people that have eyes realize that this thing is horrible. Well, I think also what happened is since then, of course, Chevy's unveiled the Silverado... Uh, they've unveiled the electric. No, scenario. no, it just looks bad to begin they, with. They've Ford unveiled the Lightning. Uh, you know, you've got the Hummer EV, and and all those vehicles look kind of like elegant and normal. Whereas this thing now looks like some, like you said, it's just a giant wedge of metal well, cheese a, it's, going it's down a the door road. Stop. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like it, you, take, you take that laptop, make it into a wedge, and drive it down the road. But the thing is, it's always looked like a doorstop. It's not like it's gotten more doorstop-ish. Now it just looks like a doorstop with mirrors. I, it's horrible. I really don't like the design of it. I never liked the design of it. Yeah, I'm going old, old man on you now. I'm going oh, old you're grumpy. You're doing the, doing the Well, it's horrible. Have you, like, just, oh. Here's, here's what I think. Of, boy, this is... We're going to get emails after this. Here's what I think is a problem, right? Like, you know what, we're, what they say about recessions? Like, by the time you figure out you're in a recession, you've been in one for like six months. Yeah. I think Tesla's actually in trouble uh, because new product is a lifeblood of any car company, right? You have to have new product. And we saw what happened when Nissan decided to mortgage the future uh, for the present under Carlos Ghosn, right? They, they, they lost market share and they really hurt themselves. Uh, and Tesla has had no new product now. I mean, I remember when I was at like a 2010 um, Detroit Auto Show and they had unveiled uh, the Model X. So the Model S and the Model X are basically the same vehicle for the last 10 years. They have the Model 3, but that's now what, a five-year-old car, a six-year-old car? Uh, 2018 was the first model year, so I think we're going on five. Four, four with four no or refresh. Five, yeah. And now the Model Y is all, basically a tall Model 3, right? It's three years old, yeah. yeah. Model X, I think, was, what, seven years ago, six years ago? Right, but there's a reason that most cars have these like life cycles where like you know four or five years, we're halfway through, they refresh them because people get bored of them. To be fair, they did do a pretty heavy refresh on the Model S. So the Model S, it's the same car. It's been refreshed a couple times. Like right. the, the first one kind of had those... The very roundy front end, and then they made it more squared off, and then the new one's a little different with the yoke and the different interior. So they have changed it, even though at, at when the, <laughs> a long time ago, you know, was like, I don't believe in refreshes, but he did refresh it a couple of times. So it is looking a little bit I, I more would, modern. I, you know what I would compare that to? The way that Volkswagen refreshed the Beetle over the you know, 30 years that it was in. I'll have you know they made over 2,000 changes over the years right? And can, in the air-cooled Volkswagen. Right, and like outside of like the split window versus the single window, it, it all looks the same. No. Have you <laughs> seen the hazard switches on different model years? Very different. And Very super, different. Oh, the Super Beetle. So well, much super, different. Well, Super Beetle had McPherson strut front suspension, I'll have you know. It looks so much different. It just looks different. It looks like it was punched in the nose. Look, I think the reason they've been able to keep the same design <laughs> and not... Well, this is also a different time, right? So today, modern cars are refreshed much more often. Well, back when you were a kid in the 30s, yes. when the Volkswagen came out, yes, uh -huh. it was probably pretty modern looking. <laughs> sure. Um, but then when you went to college in the 40s, it was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were still playing with leather helmets, Tommy. <laughs> uh, uh, but look, the reason that they haven't have to have 
you know, much more uh, refreshed vehicles is because people, when they think of electric cars, they think of Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is they're like selling into um, uh, a space let's say 96% of Americans have never owned an electric car, which is true. Yeah, sure. So they've got this 96%, so they don't need to like, you know, refresh the car because that 96% thinks of Teslas as their electric car. But at some point, people are gonna get really bored of like six colors, two interiors, four different kinds of wheels, right? Which is true. You, here in Boulder, you can go to the local supermarket, you'll see three Model 3s that are all white parked next to each other and you won't be able to tell them apart. And I, I, like I say, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just really, really, no, it's a good point. I those, think you're right. Of, of those designs. And, you know, they've put off the Roadster, right, for like four years now. And, and for all of you people who have given Tesla $250,000, I'm not making that number up, uh, to hold your Roadster, you guys have way too much money. That's a, that's you, a lot. Of... You have way too much money because <laughs> that, that number could feed a family of five for like five years. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, uh, that's, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, that's years. next level money. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So good luck to you. Uh, and for all of you who are waiting for the Cybertruck, you know, the 100,000, I think that number is going to dissipate and evaporate as people start, uh, you know, getting their uh, Rivians, Lightnings, and... Well, Hummer EVs, they're rolling them out so slowly, probably doesn't matter. Just trickling but, out. But yeah. Ford is going gonna, is gonna to spit out lightnings like Tic Tacs. Yeah. yeah, you're 100% right. They're going to, they're gonna like Tic Tacs or Tic Tacs? Tic Tacs. Because they both work. They both work, yeah. Both of those analogies like work. Tic Tacs or Tic Tacs. You're yeah. exactly right. They're gonna just, no, they're, I think they are in trouble. Um, and not just because it looks like a doorstop. I think that's a very wise thing you said. Look, so, I, I'm agreeing with you on I a know, podcast. I, I, think that, I think like the, the uh, analysts, I also think that like uh, – Musk has checked out. I think, you know, he's a consummate entrepreneur. Well, what's he up to on Twitter? Should we take a look? And he's bored. He's bored of Tesla. The company needs somebody. It needs to go from, like, Steve Jobs to, you know, the next person who, who's more of a manager uh, than he is an entrepreneur or she is an entrepreneur, right? Because I think he's bored. I think he's taken as far as he wants to take it. So now he's like, hey, what do I spend my billions on? I know I'm going to buy Twitter because I realize that my 80 million followers uh, have, you know, a, a, a huge amount of value to me because... You know, they allow me to uh, have this giant megaphone, which translates directly into revenue. Did you hear that? Uh, was this true that Tesla was looking to buy Twitter? Or, sorry, was, Elon was looking to buy Twitter? I wonder how many of those followers are just bots out of the 80 million. On on Elon's? Probably yeah. not many. Probably a lot are just bots. Uh, yeah, like guy 50, guy gets a lot of likes on his stuff. 50% of all Twitter comments are just bots. Yeah. I mean, isn't that funny? We're arguing with bots now on, on, online. That's crazy. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think he is a little checked out. I think ever since you know it went public and he lost a little bit of the control of the company, and it's just been you know, kind of one thing after another. It's he's, uh, like, he's like moved down. He's he's he, like in his head, he's moved on past Tesla, right? I was watching that 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 Gigafactory thing where he was there with Franz, uh, and I just kind of felt like uh, you know I've seen it, been there, done that over the last ten years, and you know they don't invite journalists. Uh, they don't give they don't give press cards to journalists. Uh, they got rid of their PR department, uh, uh, and I think at some point there's a reason that car companies have PR departments, and it's probably not because they want them, but because they need them. So we'll see. You know, how's that working out for you? We'll see. You know, how that happens if the economy turns south and things start to get a little bit shaky. Needless to say, we did not get an invite to the uh, no, we did not get the cyber rodeo. No, no, we did not. Mm. So I did I did go to the invite for the. Uh, Cybertruck, though. I was there. You that were was there. Fascinating. I'm event. very grateful I got to go. So thank you, Tesla, <laughs> for letting me go to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, so uh, other car. We just got another cool car that's sitting in the driveway. We just uh, did a 0 to 60 on it, uh, and it blew me away. What car is that? Because I'm going to get the. I'm, I'm going to have to bring up my dominoes with my, you know, numbers and letters on it. Well, this one's a little easier. It's a BMW i4 M50. <laughs> So is the really? i4, I think it's a little easy. <laughs> it, you could still do the same thing with it. Well, the model is the i4. And yeah, dominoes. that's true. i4 is the model, so yeah. it's the electric kind of four series um, sedan coupe thing. Yeah. And then M50 means it's the fast one. Okay. So how fast 0 to 16 did you get? Well, it's supposed to be like mid threes. Yeah, I mean, and I got 4.1 without launch control and 3.7 with launch control. That's quick? It's very quick. Yeah, it's got 
536 horsepower through a dual motor all-wheel drive setup. It does still have the beaver teeth, but it is a truly cool car. Um, you know, BMW just launched two new vehicles, the iX and the i4. Mm -hmm. And the i4 is kind of the more conventional one. Yeah, more they took an interesting approach. Like, if you didn't know that this was electric, you wouldn't guess it by looking at it, if, if you didn't see that it didn't have a tailpipe. Yeah, the i4 is more or less based on, like, the, the 4 Series yeah. gas model. Right. And then the iX is the SUV, which looks like it's, it's a spaceship and it's alien. It's got all the weird, funky interiors and all the crazy stuff. So you've got the more conventional, I'm coming from a gas car, I want the gas car experience. Experience, or you've got the wow, let's go drive a spaceship experience in the IX. But yeah, I4 drives fantastic, looks fantastic, very very quick for what it is. Um, it is quite expensive, seventy-seven thousand is the one in, in our in our uh, office this week. But it does seem to be pretty attractive. They just dropped it off, so not a huge amount of time with it. But we'll see how it is. Yeah, so given your dithers, Tommy, are you more in the I want to show off that I'm driving or I want to let people know I want to signal that I'm driving an electric car by doing something that's completely wacky like an EV6 or an Ionic 5 or, uh, you know, the i4 or do you like... IX. IX, sorry. Or do you like the more conventional design where people really don't know until you step on it at the stoplight? I do like kind of the sleeper unconventional yeah, side of too. it. I do too. I do too. We also this week had the XC40 Recharge. Except it doesn't work in that car. Why not? Because it's too boring. Well, that's what the understated is about. It's supposed yeah, to be like fly under the radar and then 402 horsepower. Yeah, we drag raced it against the uh, EV6. Yes, and even though it does look like the gasoline Volvo, it smoked the EV6 in the quarter mile. So, so it's weird, and I, I, need to, I need to do some more thinking about this. So I, I, I like the BMW that's more conventional that's electric, but I don't like the a Volvo that looks the recharge, right? The only way you can tell it's a recharger is there's a little tiny like silver badge on the back and it says recharge in the like the C pillar in black. Mm. It's black and right. black. So and can, the grill's a little different. Yeah. It's got like a like a flat you know body colored grill. But somehow I want my Volvo because Volvo is already understated. So I want my understated Volvo to not be so understated and let people know it's electric. They have one for that. But I want my overstated BMW to be understated in its electricity usage what and if, in its electricity function. What if I told you there was essentially a Volvo that is less understated? Okay. Same exact car. More Polestar. performance. Polestar 2. Yeah, Polestar. Yeah, there you go. There's your answer. So they kind of have a little bit of both going on as well. Um, I love choice. It's yeah, it's good. It's a great good. way to make people happy. Yeah, but the, the, the Volvo was a very fun car this week too. Um, not quite as, like you mentioned, as nuts as the EV6. It's got a more conventional kind of interior design and exterior design. No key. No, no key. It has a key. No up. Uh, uh, buttons though to push to no, get it no going. On button. No button. Yeah. No, no starting button. No no start button. Like just get in. Just I love that. Yeah. That was great. And not quite as impressive on the charging of the range as the EV6, but still a great car. And it really goes like stink. 486 pound feet of torque in an XC40, which is like a small squared off crossover, was really great. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I was surprised that actually, I'm not going to give away, we did a drag race with the Mini SE versus... Well, the, like since it the, smoked it in the uh, quarter mile, so I think yeah, it kind of gave SE, it away. Maybe the Mini SE came and smoked it. Well, that video is going to be up on it's already up. YouTube it's, 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 by the time you yeah. listen to this, so you can just go you watch it. You can go it. watch it, yeah. Once again, uh, alltfl.com. Yep, but really like the car. And I think that it's a little expensive, 223 miles of range for 60 grand. You know, that is that is going to be a hard sell for Volvo when you can go buy... Elon's Model Y that'll do 300 and plus range for the same price. But it was very well made, very good off-road. I actually took it off-road and it just smoked the off-road course. And a very good traction control programming. The ride's a little sporty. It's a little bit more firm than I might expect because it's got 20 inch wheels. And the range isn't quite where I'd like it to be, but overall, solid choice. So I, I gotta tell you, I'm super excited because when you're listening to this, uh, I am on my way to Vegas to drive the new Z. Z. Yeah, I'm going to get to drive the new Z. Uh, how cool is that? So um, we're going to have hopefully a both on-road and a track review of that. And an off-road. I'm not going to take the Z. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't be taking it off-road. And I'm going to go drive the new C-Class. Oh, sweet. Yeah, how about you? What are you driving? I am driving the uh, Kia Sportage. The new, new Sportage, yes. Yeah. So that's going to be cool. We've got the i4 at the office. We've got the new CX-30 Mazda coming in as well. we got the new... I want to drive the MX-30. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. No. They're not going to send that one to Colorado. That's the electric Mazda. So, so here's something funny, right? I think this is a coincidence, but probably not. How many of those MX-30s are they uh, selling? Oh. That's, that's, okay, so if you don't know what the <laughs> MX-30 is, it's their, it's their funky little electric car that has like 80 miles of range or something, right? Yeah, I mean, it was very... It was very... 
they claim uh, it's a whole thing. So it's a faff. It's a yeah, it's a whole faff. You know, like in um, is in, it faff, not faff. Oh uh, yeah, faff, faff is faff is the Range Rover way of saying it. Okay, faff. Um, there's this compliance car whole ordeal. Remember, like a yeah, bunch to, of years ago, you have to ago. build so many compliance cars for California. Yeah, California's like if you want to sell your trucks, you got to sell every uh, electric yeah. cars. So, too. So, so there was a bunch of compliance cars, like the 500e, yeah. um, like the Soul Focus EV, EV the Soul EV, which we're not very good. But yeah, yeah. anyways, um, Mazda, you know, came out with this thing, and I, there was a little bit of them trying to convince us it wasn't the compliance car. And then they told us they're selling like 600 in the first which year, which is exactly how many they needed to sell. Something like that. Yeah, it, it was. It seemed like too specific of a number. And same thing with. A Toyota, Toyota says they're going to sell like 7,000. And then you just tell me they need like 7,000. Yeah. So it sounds like it's kind of a compliance deal going on even in 2022. And, and let's, let's, let's actually lay our cards on the table during this podcast, Tommy. Let's just uh, get it out there right now uh, that the uh, Solterra and the BX4. Nope. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> BZ4X. BZ4X, AWD are the exact same car. Well, they're, 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 yes, they are. You they're, say that. Yeah, no, no, I'm not buying the like the, the manufacturer PR that these are different cars and they're different too. They're just the same car, same car, different badge. So one has shiny cladding, one has plastic <laughs> flat cladding. And the same thing. I'm gonna go out there. Same thing with the Toyota 86 and the BRZ. Same car, just the same car. If you want to, you know, wherever you can get a better deal or whatever badge you like better or whatever color you like better, just buy it from that manufacturer. They're the same car. What if I told you the Toyota and the uh, Subaru in the electric crossover has one major difference between them. Okay, I'm, I'm curious. Like you've beyond just cladding. All right, you've got, what, what is that? Significant difference. Okay, you got me. Groundbreaking difference. <laughs> All right, X mode. No, they both have X mode. No, nope. one. Toyota has X mode now. Yeah, you know Toyota that. has X mode. It's the same car. No, it is not. What? Because you can get the Toyota in. Uh, more ugly cladding on the side. <laughs> Front wheel drive. So oh. you cannot get a front-wheel drive Solterra, so, so but you can buy a front-wheel drive Toyota. I did some research. Yes. I did some research. That is the first time ever. No, I do a lot of research. <laughs> I, was, I was always curious why, like, Polestar went with, and you, you told me this, but because we were, you know, related, I didn't believe you, so now I do, uh, and I was wrong, so I apologize. So yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what I was wrong about. So I was like, I was like, you know, doing my rant about why isn't uh, the Polestar two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, and why isn't the Toyota two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the thinking is you can get better um, car control, more fun driving experience when the rear wheels push the car and the front wheels steer the car versus having the front wheels do both. Yeah. So you told me the reason. What's the reason? You, you talked to an engineer, and the engineer, and I did some research, and you were absolutely right. It was Hyundai. Yeah, the Hyundai engineers were telling me that the reason that they put front-wheel drive on the Nero, or well, sorry, the Kona, and then also the Nero, right, is because on regenerative braking, because the mass shifts to the front, you can get more region out of a front-wheel drive than in a rear-wheel drive. Thus, you get more range. Well, yes, more potential yeah, range. Yeah. And and did you talk to somebody? I, I, I know I, I Googled it and I looked it up and it's exactly right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, but they say that, but then like the EQS Mercedes sedan yeah. can do like 200 plus kilowatts on regen. Like it's a huge amount. So I do think there is some truth in that where there is a benefit, but it's probably not that big. All right. It sounds like next door they're starting to do some construction. So <laughs> I, think that's our, I, start, I think it's our turn to, to call it a day. Uh, thank you guys once again. I appreciate that you take your time and listen to us. Uh, we're really grateful for all of you out there. Uh, and uh, hopefully, Tommy, uh, this time when you're listening to this, I'll be behind the wheel of the new Z. I am so excited for that. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am. I'm a big Z. I've had three Zs. I'm super excited to drive the Z. Three? Yeah, well, my dad had one. Oh, and then you had two. Two, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll be sure to update you on the next episode of TFL Talking Cars. Yep, and check out uh, alltfl.com. And that way, I just was reading the comment, and somebody was saying, we've got too many videos on too many channels. And we really went out of our way to try to make it fun and informational. So, you know, what we're trying to do is, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to basically do an automotive um, video magazine, right? With like front of the book and back of the book and main stories and like sidebars, all that on a weekly basis. And it's hard because if you get a magazine and you saw all those stories in video format, you'd feel overwhelmed. But hopefully with alltfl.com, you'll appreciate this variety of different videos and stories and TikToks and podcasts that we have so you can choose exactly what you want. I just want to give people as much choice as possible. Well, we'll see you in the next episode. See you next time. Ciao.